Hey, how's it going? So, after last week's video where everything went right, unsettlingly so, my problem now is the most convenient way of getting data off all of those disks, all 24 of them. And the laptop that I have is completely set up for this, no problems there, I need to get an extra disk for that, that's kind of easy. The disks on the other hand, well I could do one disk at a time, it's kind of a pain in the butt. This is already set up with four disks per shelf, with all of the shelves separately powered with power supplies in them and everything like that. So it would be really convenient to use the shelves, connect them direct to my son and pull the data off that way. Which first requires doing some power conversion and taking a quick look at how the damage on the back has been done. But first of all, I've got to switch one of these to one of these. So this is a Monster Hubble 30 amp connector with a beautiful big locking ring, guaranteed never to fall out accidentally when you trip over it in the data center, to a NEMA 1030p which is a standard stove outlet that I have everything converted to because they're usually cheaper than do, although for some reason the price of these have gone back up. I used to be able to buy these things for four bucks a pop and these are now $11, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but anyway, at least that way I don't have to try and get a uh, matching Hubble outlet. So, let's start with the power and we'll look at uh, all the damage on the back as well. So I'm going to spare you all of the really boring stuff, mostly because I went ahead and did it without paying attention and forgot to film it. But this is our monster Hubble lock here. It's got a rubber seal gasket, so it's watertight with a huge locking ring that uh, clamps onto the outlet. Monster strain relief, which is a real peach. And then as I'm dumping things out of it, the actual barrel of the connector itself. Put that aside. And then uh, my NEMA 1030. I have the blades on already. Unfortunately, this cable isn't quite long enough, so I've popped the strain relief out here. When I get it all tidied up, I'll uh, shorten off these cables just so that the strain relief's really grabbing the right thing. But, conveniently with 220 like this, it doesn't actually matter which leg is which, more or less. As long as you get the neutral in the right place, that's all that really matters. And uh, cable on and you're good to go. More or less, easy enough. I fear that the damage to the back of the unit is probably going to be the greater problem. So I've also gone ahead and done all the rewiring work on this without you guys. It seemed like it would be boring as hell to make you watch and then it turned into a huge pain in the butt and yeah I'm kind of regretting it. Anyway. This is the power unit from the back of the rack. All it really is is a distribution and a breaker set. This, I think, was a cable keeper. But it has been broken off. Uh, I'm guessing it used to hinge and you would route a cable up through it, you know. Maybe this one, I'm not positive. But and you can see uh, how dinged it is. This is not the original breaker, so let me flip this thing over. And we'll get into it. <clears throat> so these original covers here, we've got the screws that retain the covers, and then these bits and pieces over here are the remnants of the original breaker, which right now I still have partially hooked up. Let me take that off quick so I can show you. I wasn't expecting that to be such a pain in the butt either, good lord. So this is the original breaker. And power in, power out. We should have our trip lines here, however, if I pop one on, you see they instantly pop back off. This 
is kind of what's left of the retaining bar that used to go there. Clearly something smashed into the back of the rack and has shattered all of this off. Uh, most of it was on the inside. The retaining bar uh, I touched very gently and it fell apart in my hand. I'm guessing because it's instantly tripping off, something's damaged on the inside. It has a remote trip here, which is this wire here. So when the main machine, the mainframe, requests that the system power off, it'd probably fire something down here and that'll trip the breaker electrically. Um, there's just not much left of it. Now, I do have another breaker, which is what's this bad boy down in here. Unfortunately, it's not quite the same. This is a 30 amp breaker with a 37 and a half trip amps. So 37 and a half amps go through here. It delays 63 seconds and then it's going to pop it. I think that's seconds. This one here came off a UPS. This one is a 220 volt 40 amp breaker and it pops at like 45 amps so it is very wrong very very wrong but I don't have anything that matches at the moment I don't know how much one of these is going to cost so I'm going to try and find the right thing to replace it with same as with the cable when I actually start using it more regularly ho 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 uh, I'll put the right gear on it. For now, I just want to make sure the bloody thing starts up. So, I have a temporary breaker in here. Which I've got on a throw, which I know does in fact work. Oh look, there's more pieces coming out of it. The inside is made up of the input bus bar. Um, I'm not entirely certain what this thing is here, and then there's a gentle logic board which I'm assuming is what triggers the remote pop from the um, controls. So the mainframe connects to J2, and then you can use J1 and J3 to reach out and hit the other iOS cabinets so they chain between each other, so you can pop all the iOS cabinets at once. And this is the actual outlet to the rest of the rack, which I'll show you in a second. I verified that with the breaker on, I get voltage all the way through, at least I get continuity. So for now, I'm going to leave it like this and call it good. With the big proviso that it makes me really nervous putting a, effectively a 50 amp breaker on what's supposed to be a 30 amp breaker outlet. So. The electrical people are frowning at me, but it should get me going for now. So I haven't put the bulkhead back together and installed it yet, but I wanted to show you roughly where it was. So this up here is the back bulkhead that has the Ethernet connections on it, things like that. I've currently got it moved up. It normally sits here. The power bulkhead slots into the back right here. A little bit higher. There we go, like that. And you see you've got a nice big twist lock here. It's really quite a cute little system. There is a power bar in here, which runs up the inside of the rack. And it just simply slots in like so. It's a really <laughs> elegant solution to the problem. This is the external power connector that comes off the mainframe that goes here that will force the breakage trip when the system is turned off or if it locates a significant fault. Easy. So, now I've got that together, I need to reassemble this and figure out, well, where the voltage are going through, I suppose. Okay, we're continuing a couple of days later. One of my co-workers accidentally popped a disc into a machine that had a partial RAID array and the secondary disc in the RAID array overwrote the disc that he just popped in and destroyed a system that hadn't been backed up in nine months. Um, backups, 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 backups. Backup and then do it again. And test your backups. Because unlike this guy right here, 
it doesn't do any good when you try and pull it back up and discover that the data is either corrupt or in my case cannot actually be imported because the software is garbage. Anyway, I have the power box back together again. It's mounted back into the rack. I'll get this guy out of the way. And I have it plugged into the wall. So what we're going to start with is making sure first of all that uh, we have no random AC on our line. I suppose that means we should probably get a uh, little box switch to AC there. There we go. Let's see if we can put our hand in the back here. Not really. That's inconvenient. Alright, nothing interesting going on there. So let's give ourselves Well, there's no funny pops, that's a good sign. Let's see. Hundred and nineteen. Let's check the other leg. Hundred and twenty-five. Interesting difference. And then let's check across the legs if I can bend my fingers that way. There we go, 245, okay. So let's pop that off again and plug the rest of the rack in. Now currently I have it... Um, did I get that right? I have all of the rack units disconnected. Come on you son of a gun, get in there. There it goes, and locked. So each of the disc shelves in the VME bus is disconnected. So, in theory... Hmm, no pops. No funny smell. Let's uh, see what's happening further up. So, let's check our outlets. We'll uh, ground and... or neutral in this case. Oh. One leg, 124, check the other leg, 119, and across them, 244, let's try the one above, 244, go below, between them, 244, okay, so we have consistent voltage at the outlet here. I guess we'll plug it a rack unit. So we're going to continue. I'm vaguely nervous but all of the discs are unplugged from the power supply. The front switch is off. Let me plug in the 220 volts, and then we'll flip the rear switch. I heard a little click in the back. And we'll flip the front switch, and I'm imagining these fans are going to spin up. That's a good sign. I've got my voltage switched to DC now. And... Nothing interesting. Oh, 5 volts. Good, good. And then we should have 12 here. That's interesting. 5 volts. Oh, I bet they've got switch grounds. Never mind. Silly rabbit. Tricks for kids. There we go. 12 volts. So the grounds are specific to each line. That's interesting, that's kind of cool. Okay, 5 volts and 12 volts. Looks pretty steady, although I don't have a oscilloscope on it to check. Ripple, but... God help me. I think uh, it works. Huh. Cool. Well, everything's going awfully right. Actually, it makes me kind of nervous. Anyway, we appear to have power in the box in the rear, in the rear distribution panel, 
in the shelf, the internal power supply in the shelf seems to work. Everything seems to be working as it's supposed to. Don't jinx it. So obviously the shelves are cabled up for SCSI. My plan next is to connect the J2 and the J4 ports on the back of the shelf. Two of the discs are on one cable on the J2 port, two of the discs are on the J4 port. Now you might recall those from the iOS cabinet video, seems like forever ago, a couple of months. My Ultra 2 has two ISP1000 QLogic SCSI cards on it. So my plan is to connect J2 to one, J4 to the other, boot into FreeBSD, bring up all four disks at once, and assuming nothing goes catastrophically wrong, start copying some big fat Cray data all at once. I kind of rushed through some of the videoing on this one with the electrical work. I apologize for that. It wasn't my plan. Things sort of went awry. If it seems that you really want to watch me uh, wire up a NEMA 1030 from one of these big Hubbles, uh, I have to do the other on the mainframe. So if you really want to see it, let me know and I can video that. Elsewise, well, before anything goes terribly wrong, I think I'll call it good here and we can pick up maybe next week or the week after and copy off some disk data. Yay! I have soccer tournaments this weekend and next weekend and then I will be free! So hopefully I can get back to doing this a bit more regular basis. Anyways, thank you so very much for all the comments. I really appreciate it. All of the suggestions. I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. Take care. Just kidding.